Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library and I'm really pleased to be here with author Louise Hare coming to us from England across the pond from us, from me, <laughs> um, later in the evening for her uh, afternoon tea time for me. And um, we are going to be talking about Louise's new book, Harlem After Midnight. And we have a lot to dig into with that. But before we get started, I just want to say a couple of things. One is that I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our adult programming. We could not do all this fun stuff without them. Also, um, Louise agreed to let us share this program with some other libraries. So I'd like to welcome the patrons from the various libraries that partnered with us on this program. And um, you can buy signed books from Louise by, by book plate because she sent them across the pond um, from Aesop's Fable. I'll put a link to that in the chat as we go. If you have questions for Louise, please put them in the Q&A. There's a button at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen and I will moderate those to her. I will also be paying attention to the chat since it's gonna be, um, uh, you know, we, we, uh, <laughs> my brain's all together today. So without further ado, um, Louise Hare, like I said, coming from England, her newest book is Harlem After Midnight, the second in a series. And it actually, you know what, I think people probably want to hear from you, Louise, as opposed to me. Tell me about, tell us about yourself and Harlem After Midnight. Okay. Um, well, I'm British, as you said. I currently live in London and um Technically, Harlem After Midnight is my third book, but it is the second in a series um, featuring um, Lena Aldridge. So the first book in the series is called Miss Aldridge Regrets. Um, and sort of just to briefly talk about the first book, because it leads straight on to the, the second. So at the beginning, when we meet Lena, um, she's sort of 26 years old um, and kind of at a crossroads. She's a jazz singer. She had all these great aspirations. She really wanted to be like a star on a West End stage, um, but it's kind of not worked out for that. She's just singing in this kind of divey jazz club in Soho in London. And then she gets offered this amazing opportunity, which is to sing in a Broadway show. And she gets given this first class ticket on the Queen Mary to travel to New York. Um, and the year is 1936. So, you know, this is like the height of glamour. Everyone who has everyone traveled on the Queen Mary between New York and Southampton and so she goes on the boat lots of murders she's trying to figure out what's going on she's trying to figure out if she's a potential victim or is she being set up as the murderer um and obviously at the end of that she is in New York which leads me on to the second book um Harlem After Midnight which is also a, a murder mystery uh, slightly less murdering in this one. I, I figured <laughs> she's unlucky, but she's not that unlucky. Um, and at the start of this book, it literally starts the day that the previous book finished. And on board the boat, she made friends with a musician called Will. And they have this affinity because I guess they're both sort of musicians. And he was the person that she, she knew that he wasn't the murderer. So he was kind of like the safe person that she could hang out with. Um, while well, she's trying not to get murdered and uh, so she goes and stays with friends of his in Harlem um, but obviously uh, you'll see from the very first page that is you know things aren't going to be perfect for her um, there is a body that falls from a window on the very first page who is it we don't know yet um, so she's got another uh, murder to sort of solve or investigate or not you know not be part of um, but at the same time she's trying to um, delve into the history of her father who uh, in the first book there were some secrets about his past he's deceased um, but he actually lived in New York for a period so she's sort of thinking well you know this is a great opportunity for him to find out why he left New York why he moved to London you know all that kind of thing so there's quite a lot going on <laughs> Actually, I was going to say that, that the, there's so much um, to dig into for this story because, you know, there's mystery, there's historical fiction, there's romance, potentially, there's, um, you know, secrets and lies and music and, uh, you know, and the setting and the time frame are so interesting. So before we get to that, though, I would like to know a little bit more about you and because I do want to dig into the book pretty deeply, but let's talk about you first. So have you always wanted to be a writer? I think, well, when I was 
a kid, yes, I loved writing. And then I feel like, I don't know, maybe in high school, they kind of beat it out of me oh. <laughs> uh, a little bit. Um, I didn't love English at school, actually, um, because I felt it was very prescribed that like you had to read these very set books and have these very set opinions about those books. Um, and we didn't get to do much creative writing. It was very focused on um, my school, at least. It was very focused on passing an exam at the end of it. Um, and so I always loved reading. And I never lost that, you know, I've always been, I've always had the maximum books out of the library at any one time. And, you know, I'm overflowing with books, like every room in, in my flat. Um, and yeah, it was probably only about eight, nine years ago that I guess I was kind of bored with the day job. And I, I figured if I could find a creative hobby that would kind of keep me going. Mm -hmm. And so it was only ever supposed to be a hobby. I, I sort of did this a uh, short course on how to get started writing a novel mm -hmm. uh, and at the end of that I I did have an idea for something and people in the group seemed to think it was a good idea or something that they would be interested in reading so um and it's I mean this book's in published it's the book in the drawer that so many authors have um it was set in Victorian times in London and I spent you know I did the usual mistake that I think a lot of writers make when they're I guess sort of getting started which is to spend so long doing research um so I spent probably like a year researching I knew everything about you know the great exhibition that was in London in the 1850s and I knew everything about um the house that my character lived in and, and all this kind of stuff but I I hadn't sort of thought about the story mm. so I finally got around to writing the story so that was about another 18 months um and sort of sent it out to agents and things uh had lots of rejection uh but some positive feedback as well which is why I then decided to sign up for a master's course in creative writing um and I actually wrote two short stories on that course one which became my UK debut um which is a book called This Lovely City and then Miss Soldier's Regrets was another short story mm -hmm. um basically I'm rubbish at short stories because the feedback on both of those were um like you haven't like this isn't the end like the we want to know what happens to this person afterwards therefore it's not a short story it's a chapter mm -hmm. so then I had to kind of figure out okay well what what does happen to this person next mm -hmm. and you know luckily enough for me I managed to figure that out and write two novels <laughs> <laughs> and what um what did you read what before you became a writer were you drawn to any particular genre I kind of read pretty much anything um I've always loved historical fiction um I love fantasy when I was a teenager I, I used to love anything that was a thousand pages plus oh. I would read <laughs> um <laughs> most teens avoid anything over like 20 pages <laughs> yeah I, I just loved anything like that um I mean, Stephen King's The Stand, I think I read like five times when I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> Did you read the new, the expanded one? The, yeah, yeah. Yeah, me too. I mean, yeah, I just, I just love, I think once you've got a good story, you just don't want it to end. So like for me, perfect. Um, and then, yeah, like crime fiction as well. Like I read, my school library had, you know, shells full of Agatha Christie novels. So I read all of those um yeah pretty much I don't think there's a genre that I wouldn't read oh apart from that I don't really get spy novels I think they sort of go over my head a little bit but apart from that um it, this is really interesting because um not that you know your character is a spy but like they're trying to solve mysteries so like there's an aspect of that to uh Lena right yeah I think it's all the government stuff when they get into um, the thing, they get a bit like what huh um so so yeah although I love uh there's a series by Mick Heron which is sort of um sort of people from you know British spies who are just a, a little bit terrible at their jobs and they all get moved into this one department for to get given all the, the rubbish jobs that no one wants so I kind of like that series because they also don't really know what's going on so I can follow <laughs> easily <laughs> I love it so Susan asks um and I have the same question given that your wide variety of reading 
and you know what drew you to this sort of historical fiction mystery mashup yeah I think um well my debut novel there is a mystery in it but it wasn't sort of I guess it's not crime as such it's just more like historical set in 1950s London um and I I guess historical in particular because I felt that I really struggled. It's a genre that I love. And I really struggled to find books written by Black British authors that are historical. Mm. You had to fit, like, I felt like you had to fit a very certain niche um, to get published. And I just thought, you know, actually, I is that um, quote from Tony Morrison, which I will, I will butcher, but it's basically, you know, you should, if there's a book that you want to read that doesn't exist, you should write it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought, well, I don't really know what I'm doing, so I might as well start off doing doing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I and I really enjoyed it. And I I guess I want to write those books that don't currently exist mm-hmm. rather than trying to copy stuff that's already out there. Mm-hmm. Why do you, why do you think that is that there weren't books that sort of reflected your own background or history or interests? Um, in Britain, I mean, we in in America, like we sort of almost, you know, we're just starting to get there. But why in Britain where they didn't have the same, or it seems like they didn't have the same background, I'll just say. Yeah. Um, so in the UK, I guess there was this there was a perception that black people didn't read. So therefore they wouldn't buy the books. And there was also the perception that if there were books with black characters, only black people would buy them. Mm-hmm. which is which is crazy but that was kind of one of they're very risk averse in publishing I, I'm sure on both sides of the Atlantic mm-hmm. so the books by black authors that you could buy you know quite wise widely um I guess were well Zadie Smith <laughs> yeah was you know, one of the few black British authors we had the had, and then everyone else was pretty much American so they'd mm-hmm. wait for something to be a bestseller in the US and then they would buy it for the UK because they'd be like oh it did really well there so let's just do that whereas it was really hard for black British authors to get published in the UK mm-hmm. um, and that's that's changed a lot actually probably in but as recently as probably the last five to six years that's changed I think um there's been a lot of big shakeups in publishing um especially since 2020 I think events in 2020 weirdly hit really hard in the UK as well as the US um, in terms of like George Floyd and things, and there was a real um, push for publishing here to sort of reflect society a little bit more wisely. And um, I think we'll see, hopefully that continues. I think it's it's making good strides so far. So, yeah. Yeah, because we were talking about this a little bit before we started this program is that, um, you know, you took, um, you know, your, your character from... And I'm going to say Lena, right? <laughs> I can't, I can't be Lena or Lena. I keep getting it wrong. Lena. I say Lena. <laughs> Lena, okay. I just want to make sure because I know it's one of the other. Um, so you took Lena from you, the UK to the US in Harlem um, at a time where in Britain, you know, like World War uh, One was World War II, like they were, ha- you know, heading in that direction where in the US, we still had the Jim Crow and things like that. So what made you want to change that setting to a place to a place that would be problematic for her, more potentially more problematic for her? Um, I guess because so when I when I wrote the first book, Miss Aldrich, Aldrich Regrets, originally it wasn't supposed to be a series, it was just gonna be a standalone book. And then when I got my US publishing deal, they were like, oh, but there's so much like stuff that you could still explore with this character. We could do it at least one more book, if not, you know, a whole series. Um, and I guess sort of writing that book, um, because Lena's passing as mixed race, but passing as white. And there was like, I guess there was just lots of things that sort of came out of that that were interesting. There was still a lot more to explore with that. So I felt like because she's grown up in this, I guess this environment where she's, often been the only person of color but then sometimes when she is um singing she's with a a band of black musicians but then she also feels that she doesn't necessarily fit in with them because 
like they have their own stuff going on they kind of see her you know walking around as if she's white and so they're not they're not sure about her either and so that was one of the things that came out of that and so I thought yeah if we put her in this black community um how is she then going to reflect on on that experience how are people going to treat her um and and then what happens if she meets someone like the character Belle um who's quite divisive <laughs> in this story um what if she meets someone who is who can also pass and what will they how will they, they interact and how will she sort of evaluate that experience when she sees how someone else behaves who can who you know has that similar experience mm -hmm. right because there were parts of this book that uh Harlem after midnight that that she did pass or try you know like she and Belle uh went places as um as white women um and you know like how did that influence the story like having to do that in, because they were in the U.S. versus someplace else yeah, it was it was very interesting, and it was definitely something that I wanted to show. Um, and I think especially because she's sort of starting this relationship with Will, the musician, and he definitely cannot pass. Um, and also because Belle's his sort of stepsister, and there's some friction in that relationship. Um, it was just a it was just a great tool for sort of playing around with all those different dynamics, those relationship dynamics between those three and. And then the other people that, that Lena's staying with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I had a lot of fun sort of thinking of scenarios where um where Lena might feel guilty that she's, you know, she's going somewhere that Will couldn't go to. Mm -hmm. Um and you know, yeah, thinking how does she deal with that? Does she just go, well, so what? Like, let me just enjoy myself, or does she feel bad? Mm -hmm. And you had said again before we started that you've been to New York at least five or six times. So did that influence your wanting to write about Harlem? Um, I guess I've always been interested in the Harlem Renaissance anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess particularly with this book, um, it's sort of a little tribute to the book Passing by Nella Larson, which I've always loved. Um, and I've always been fascinated with. Um, so, so I think, you know, things like, you know, the relationship between Belle and Lena is sort of a reflection of, not a direct reflection, but, you know, similar but like I wanted a similar vibe to the two women in that book uh the woman falling from the window obviously is sort of the iconic um moment and and yeah I just kind of wanted to once I'd sort of figured out okay there's going to be a second book and and I you know I'd already put in the first book that she was going to go to Harlem just to see Will mm -hmm. so I was like oh this is perfect like I can sort of explore um those things I can still have a, a, a mystery um but but also explore these different themes that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And you said for your very first book that um, uh, you were talking about, you spent a year doing the research. What was your favorite part of researching this book? What was like the best tidbit you you discovered? Oh, um, there were there were two things. Um, so one of the fascinating things. I found in the library was um, a biography of Nella Larson. Mm -hmm. um, and she lived an incredible life. Like she was, you know, doing her own thing completely, you know, um, definitely a, a flawed woman, but someone who didn't take no for an answer. You know, she traveled around Europe on her own and, you know, probably had affairs and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, so reading about her life was, because sometimes I think when you're writing historical fiction, especially when you're writing women, you're always scared like you know what were the um you know what were the expectations at the time because you know we think that we're in back in the past we're very you know downtrodden and had to you know be thinking about marriage and all this kind of thing and she definitely wasn't so I was like you know I feel safe with Lena who <laughs> <laughs> uh, was not a you know not fulfilling those traditional roles but I was like yeah I feel like this is okay um and then the other thing which just was amazing because so with my first book I chose a very specific crossing on the Queen Mary so the dates tie up with a an actual passage from Southampton to New York so obviously with the second book I was very stuck with these set dates mm -hmm. um and the very night that I wanted Lena to go to the Savoy Ballroom so that I could sort of explore the music and the dancing and everything um, when I was researching, it turned out 
the, the ballroom had been closed, but it reopened that night. It had been refurbished. And Ella Fitzgerald was playing that night. I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> I love that serendipity. <laughs> <laughs> so she really, I mean, in your book, Lena really had the opportunity to um, have the full experience of Harlem, as you said, the Savoy, the passing, the music, the, you know, um, the dynamics, the social dynamics. Um, was there anything that really that you felt like when you were doing the research that um, that you were like, oh, I don't want to I, I don't want to include that. That's or like, you know, that was just like, oh, you know, let's just this is not this is not part of the story that I want to tell um not in I guess not in a negative way um I think the problem with research is you always find out all this crazy stuff that you want to include right and it's figuring out what works for the story so sometimes there's stuff that you find out that you're like oh that'd be, I'm I'm super interested in that but then you're like oh but if I put it in it the reader's gonna be like well she's super interested in this but this is kind of not interesting for anyone else it doesn't really work for the story so so yeah there's sometimes there's stuff that you start to leave out because it doesn't fit mm -hmm. um and especially I think for this book because there are two timelines so I had literally had to I was quite annoyed with myself because when I thought I was like this is a great idea let me do 1936 and 1908 and then I realized how much New York changed in those 30 years and so I literally had to do two separate lots of research so I mean yeah it was worth it but <laughs> yeah there's just like so much stuff you have to leave you have all these like notebooks of of stuff and you just have to go okay what's important or what what's the story that I'm telling and what fits mm -hmm. so let's let's dig into the story a little bit did, did you plot it out because you didn't know you were going to write a second book when you first wrote the first one so how did are you a plotter or are you a pantser at this time I am a pantser, so um, I didn't know, yeah, I didn't know who was um, the murderer. Um, I decided later on, because with the first book with Miss Aldridge Regrets, I decided who the murderer was before I started. Then I got to the end and realized it wasn't them. Uh, so, I, <laughs> so, I, so I was like, this time I'm just not even going to, okay, I'm just going to work out who's around at the end, who's got motive, and then I'll, and then I'll decide. Mm -hmm. Um so I did it, I did it that way. Um, the only thing I do in terms of plotting is I try and work out what needs to happen by which which stage. So most of my books are about 100,000 words. So I'll be like, okay, so by 20,000 words, something like this needs to have happened. And by 40,000 words, something like this needs to have happened. Um, and so I just do it that way. So it's it's like, you know, a page of notes is my is my plotting <laughs> but yeah I I kind of have fun with it mm -hmm. um uh I'm, I'm I'm not a spreadsheet girl I know people that are will literally plot like spend three months planning um the novel before they even start writing it and then they write it really quickly and I kind of wish I could do that that's I mean the idea of writing a novel in like a month sounds amazing um, but I'd rather take, I think I'd rather take nine months and to do a first draft and, and just have fun with it and, mm -hmm. and see where it goes. Cause a lot of my characters just pop up. Um, mm -hmm. so Will, who's in both books just sort of came out of a, a random scene that I was writing where I had Lena out on deck on the ship. And I was like, I feel there needs to be somebody who comes up to her here and it was Will. And then he ended up becoming a big part of the book. So so yeah, I think if I plotted too much, you'd lose those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Does that pantser thing, does that surprise you given that you didn't know you were going to be a writer um, until eight or nine, 10 years ago? I, uh, I don't know. I feel like, um, I feel like a lot of people are pantsers. So I'm, I'm kind of, um, I got a call cool with that. And I, I always used to love, like when I was a kid and I used to write, I used to love those exercises where the teacher just gives you like a sentence mm -hmm. or they give you sort of five items and you have to sort of come up with a story around that and it's just completely free. I think I like that idea of just being able to do anything mm -hmm. and be completely sort of prescribed to you. So, so yeah, maybe I've always been a pantser. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to work for you, you know? I, and you're right. Like almost all the authors I talk to say that they're pantsers. They they don't like to outline. Um, it felt it feels very restrictive to them. 
Yeah. But um, so you explained Will a little bit. Does he, do your characters sort of like come to you fully formed um, in terms of like their, who they're, who they are, their backstory, all that, or does that happen over time as you write them more? Hmm. I get, I mean, with Will, his backstory, I hadn't really thought about in the first book. It came, I mean, it comes in very heavily yeah. <laughs> in her life. Um, I knew, I knew what kind of, I know what kind of person they are. So I know if they're, you know, a kind person or if they're impatient, you know, I know those sort of basic things about them um, immediately. Mm-hmm. And then the more that I write, the more scenes I write with the men, the better I get to know them. Um, but yeah, like backstory, again, because backstory is tricky. I always try and leave that till later because otherwise, again, you want to put it in and, and it kind of doesn't always belong um belong in the story um but sometimes it takes like leader's backstory completely decides to take over the first book all the stuff with her her past and all that kind of thing mm-hmm. um but yeah I think I really like I always see the first draft as getting to know the characters mm-hmm. um and see who belongs because sometimes at the end of the first draft I'll cut some out and then I know I'll merge them or you know I'll play around with it the first draft is really just you know, here are all the ideas, what works, what doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And sort of the second draft is more when the book feels like it's moving towards something that one day will be published. I think all of my first drafts, you you know, you wouldn't want, you know, anyone public to, to see it. <laughs> <laughs> They're very messy. <laughs> I think that's probably true. Oh, um, probably true of most authors <laughs> as well. Um, so what comes to you first, the setting, the plot, or the characters, or something else? Um, I think I usually start with an image in my head of a person in a in a setting. So maybe the character in the setting pretty much at the same time. Mm-hmm. And then the story I figure out, sometimes much later, <laughs> um, <laughs> like I just sort of start with a scene. And then sort of think, okay, well, what do I want this book to be about? Like, does it, do I want it to be like a really full on murder mystery? So for example, Miss Soldier's Regret started as a short story, which was just a woman singing in a bar and someone's murdered in front of her. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is carried into the, the novel. Um, but at the end of the short story, she leaves and she's got a ticket to get on a ship. And so then I was like, okay she's getting on a ship so what does that because then you need to tie that in I was like well so there needs to be more murders so then so then I was sort of almost sort of backwards engineering like okay so this is all linked and just sort of yeah trying to figure out what's going on why is she getting on the ship because in the short story it was just kind of like she wanted to get the hell out of there but like that's not really good enough (laughs) for a novel you need like a proper of a reason so yeah I, I think I like I'm quite a visual writer so I like to sort of picture something and then go okay what what happened just before this or what's going to happen just after this mm-hmm. and um did you have a playlist that you listened to while you were writing this book because you know music in Harlem is very different from place most other places especially at that time yeah, I mean, I listen to lots of jazz. So, I'm, I mean, I mostly listen to Ella Fitzgerald mm-hmm. uh, and uh, a little bit of Gregory Porter as well, who obviously wasn't alive at the time, but, mm-hmm. you know, singing those sort of classic jazz songs. And um, I haven't made a playlist on Spotify or anything, but there is, um, so in each book, there are sections and each section is the name of a, a jazz standard that that would have been, uh, popular in by 1936 either a little bit earlier or lots of Gershwin and lots of stuff that Ella Fitzgerald sang mm-hmm. um, so so yeah I think it'd be quite nice if people want to listen to some jazz as they read <laughs> <laughs> actually I um, was reading um, about the I didn't get to listen to the audiobook but I heard the audiobook was really good and um, somebody mentioned online that it would be really amazing to have this as a full graphic audio because of the music um you know where you have you know it's like a full cast 
um, audio book basically. And um, I, I think that would be pretty cool actually. That would be really cool. That'd be really cool. Yeah. yeah. I'll make that happen. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the actual story now. So your, your, your structure of your book is actually very complex um what made you decide to do that where you said like you have two different timelines you have sort of two different murders sort of um and then you know all the other stuff that's going on yeah um so because I don't plan I start off with these ideas that feel very simple and then I overcomplicate them (laughs) and then I'm like oh okay so how am I actually going to do this so I think because I I knew I wanted to have, because part of the reason, one of the reasons that Lena's gone to Harlem is that she wants to find out more about her father. So then it kind of made sense for me to have some chapters showing that because it's really hard to tell the reader just through her investigation what actually happened to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's never going to be able to find out all the little details because, you know, there's there's not really anyone there to tell her that. She can, She ends up finding out uh, so quite shocking stuff um, but you know to get all those details and that feel for what it was like for him to live in New York in 1908 and he's originally from uh, Florida and so was part of that sort of great migration um, you know it felt like that needed to be a separate timeline mm-hmm. and then because then I was thinking okay so why did he leave New York um, which is where Jesse his sister comes in and then there was some stuff where I felt like it needed to be her point of view as well. So yeah, so I ended up with these sort of three points of view. Um, Selena is obviously by far the main one, but then you have these two voices from 1908 um, and exploring, exploring that with like 1908 New York was so interesting mm-hmm. uh, through like the Tenderloin and uh, all those saloons and the places that, people would go in in those days very interesting yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and I think that um again there there's this entire racial component going on too at the same time as you said the great migration and things like that so was it um important to you to show what was going on in America at that time versus you know your first book which was in England and those issues weren't really as um prevalent maybe yeah, I think it was just something I became, became more interested in the more I read um, and especially stuff that was written by African-Americans who had lived through that experience and part of the Harlem Renaissance. Mm-hmm. It became this fascinating history that I hadn't personally read much of before. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe that's just for being British, I'm, I don't know. Um, and so I felt like, yeah, I would like to to show that and show what this guy lived, how this guy lived and how um, how he made a living, but then also how it ties into like the bigger story. And um, and I guess show a little bit of that transition in New York because obviously by the time Lena gets there, you know, the, the black area is sort of moving further and further north in Manhattan, mm-hmm. um, it reaches Harlem. So yeah, it's kind of interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so in your in in the story, there were lots. I mean, every character seemed to have secrets um, and relationships, and how that affected the secrets affected the relationships. Like, how did you decide, like, how deep you were going to go into somebody's psyche to to like pull out what's going on for them? Yeah, um, I love secrets, and <laughs> so I feel like I've always got like little secrets. Um, like I, I remember a friend who read my very first book and he was like, but if they just told each other everything at the beginning, they would have had all these issues. And I was like, yeah, but then there would be no book because <laughs> the whole point of the book is they did keep these things. Because I think we have, we have different reasons for keeping secrets. Sometimes we just don't know people that well, that we like, well, you know, and it would, they would, they're not like big secrets, but they're stuff that you tell people once you know them better. Mm-hmm. And then some of the uh, secrets that you're ashamed of, things that you're ashamed of. I think for Will, certainly that that was why um, he kept his sort of big secret. 
Um, Lena's just got so many secrets and she's sort of kept them a little bit too long. So even though they're not even necessarily her secrets, they're other people's secrets, she sort of kept them to herself a lot so long that she's now too scared to tell people. So yeah, I kind of like looking at a the secrets, but also why people are keeping the secrets. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just find it interesting. And how do you decide how to unfurl those secrets from people? You know, what makes you know will be be able to tell Lena what's going on for him? What it, what does he need for that to happen? Um, I think partly. I mean, to be honest, I think Will partly tells Lena his secrets because he thinks that someone else will tell her. So he knows he has to get in there. This <laughs> <laughs> is the thing, like everyone that he knows in Harlem knows everything that happened to him. Um, so it's only Lena that doesn't know. And so at that point, she's mixing it with all his friends and family. He's like, someone's going to have one too many gins and say something. So I'm just going to... But then he doesn't tell her the whole of it. So again, it's that kind of you know, he's trying to sort of balance out, you know, let me just try this little bit of a secret. Okay, she's okay with that. Like, is she okay with that? And so he's trying to figure that out. Um, whereas obviously Lena is kind of like, well, no one here knows me. So I can kind of be similar to it in the first book. She's sort of passing, but she's trying to, you know, she's playing a character to an extent. Um, in this book, less so because she is amongst friends, but she is still able to, decide um how she presents herself Mm -hmm. yeah and you know I don't I don't know your complete background but how did how do you do relationships so well in writing like do you have a psychology degree (laughs) just amazing (laughs) um I did psychology at high school but yeah it was kind of basic um I'm just I guess I'm always fascinated by people and why they do the things they do because people people do things you wouldn't expect all of the time and and yeah I'm always I'm always thinking like why would you do that like why you know some of them people do stuff that's so out of character and you think what drove you to that and so I'm always thinking of the reasons and so you know my characters aren't based on anyone that I know <laughs> or anyone in particular but yeah I'm always kind of thinking okay if I throw someone into this situation you know what are the different options of how they're going to react and and why and which one do I choose which one do I think works for this character Mm -hmm. Uh, so so for example for Will because I knew he's he's always been a good guy in my in my mind from the first book onwards but I knew that I needed him to have some secrets of his own um, and in the way that draws him and Lena to like closer together. So then it's like, okay, well, what's what's the secret that someone could be ashamed of, but that isn't so bad? Like you like that is understandable. Um so, so yeah, that was how I kind of went about that. Mm-hmm. So I love the fact that you're you've got two and potentially three books here because you can really dig into the characters and the, and their um who they are. Um but then do you, the more you know them, are you more likely to throw them into situations where they would act out of character so that you can explore how they would handle difficult situations? Like, just for an example, having somebody fall out of a window, you know, like, you know, in having to deal with whatever comes up in that situation, because like, she's not a detective, she's not a spy, she's not a, you know, she's just a, just some woman walking down the street. So yeah, do you know her well enough to know that if she'll react in, in character or in or just like this will throw her out? Yeah, I feel like, well, I feel like by this second book, like I know, I know Lena and I know Will. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some characters, if, if I get the chance to write a third book, there were some characters from the first novel that I want to go back to because I feel like some people did some things in the first book that, I wasn't able to because I had to get Lena out of London. We never sort of explored fully. Um, so yeah, I'd love to go back and and see what's ha- what's happening with them and see, you know, how Lena's going to deal with that situation because mm-hmm. those are people that she grew up with. 
and she's got to go back and and sort of figure out can they still be friends can they you know like what's what is their relationship going to be moving forward so that, I think that's going to be an interesting sort of theme to her mm. to focus on yeah well I don't think I'm telling anybody too much of a spoiler to say that it, because this was in all of the reviews is that there's a slight cliffhanger at the second at the end of the second book so um do you know if you're going to write the third book because it seems like you kind of have to now <laughs> I want to I've got an idea for a third book um but it's not gonna be my next book I'm writing something completely different for the next one um so maybe after I finish battling that one we can think about Lena again <laughs> did you need like a palate cleanser or you just uh don't have it sold yet yeah uh a bit of both actually the book I'm sort of trying to figure out at the moment I actually wrote a really messy first draft of back in 2020 is like my lockdown book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I finally, I think, figured out how to fix it. Um, but it's completely different. It's 1760s London, slavery and prostitution on the streets of London. <laughs> so another fun female character, I think. Um, but yeah, maybe a little bit darker, mm-hmm. if that's possible. <laughs> That sounds, that sounds amazing. I'm I'm particularly interested in books that shine a light on, um, you know, black characters or black people throughout history that just are not told. Because even if it's fictionalized, though there were actual people in the world doing those things throughout history, right? Um, do you feel like those are stories that you're going to be digging into in the future? I think so. I mean, with this book, I'm. He's not my main character. He's a a character who makes friends with my main character. Um, but he's based on him. He's like a real person um, mm-hmm. who existed, who um, was basically an escaped slave in London. His, his master had sort of beaten him and left him for dead in the street. And someone found him, took him to a hospital and paid for his treatment. Um, he semi-recovered. He was always like disabled after that, but he managed to get some work. And then two years later, this guy who'd beaten him to death saw him in the street recognized him and sold him to a slave trader going to Barbados um and I guess I was fascinated by this because I think in the UK we're always so proud of the fact that we we didn't do slavery at home we did it in other places um but actually there are adverts you can find adverts and recorded documents that said that people were going to like in pubs so you go to a pub and you could buy a slave and then, you know, and that was all going on in the UK, but we just sort of like to pretend it didn't happen because we didn't have it out in public. It's all hidden away. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I kind of just wanted to confront that and be like, actually, yes, this did used to go on and um, people were getting basically kidnapped off the street in London um, mm-hmm. and sold into slavery. So, yeah, that's what I'm trying to pull together at the moment. It sounds fascinating, um, partly because, again, that hidden history. But did you find the research for that to be difficult because those stories are not typically told? Um, the good news is that um, so the guy, one of the guys that helped um, this escaped slave, uh, or how you want to call him, his name was Jonathan Strong. Um, he became uh, he was just a normal guy. Um, until this happened to him and he found and then he saw that how unjust this was and so he um dragged this into court and again sort of got him off on a technicality so he didn't get sent to Barbados and so then he became known in the black community so when other people had similar problems they would go to him and he would um sort of try and help them in a legal way because again there was no specific law against slavery so it was he was almost sort of getting people off on technicalities through various things you know as if they were property so you know you can't just take property off the street essentially kind of thing um so there were he wrote books so I live quite close to the British Library in London so you can go and get papers out that he wrote and things like that you can get lots of books from the 1700s that you're allowed to sort of you know, sit in the room and turn the pages carefully. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's really cool. Mm-hmm. So there's lots of gaps in in this guy's story, which 
to be honest, as a novelist is great because I can sort of fill those gaps myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious that you said that you, this was your pandemic book because the libraries would have been closed physically during the early part of the pandemic. So how did you do your research at that point? So I'd started sort of planning the story. I had a couple of books at home that sort of covered the basics of the story. And then in the summer, they did this thing at the British Library where you could, you could, you were allowed to go for like two hours a week or two oh. hours per day. You could book, so you had to book in online. It was all very distanced. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a beautiful summer that year. So I used to love it. So I'd go uh, on the tube and I'd stand. You had to queue all the way around like the courtyard, like socially distanced, but it was lovely weather. So it's kind of like a day out and mm -hmm. then go and sit two hours uh, in the nice cool reading room. Mm -hmm my research um and then they were like quarantine the books so I could only I could only actually go once a week because I was using a lot of the same books and then once you handed them in they were like no one can take these books out for three four days because of covid um but yeah it was kind of like my little weekly outing <laughs> to the library <laughs> library saved lives what can I say <laughs> wow I, th I think there's like just this fascination for me, like this fascination around the fact that, you know, a lot of what you're doing and writing and in, in, is in England, but yet you still have some movement into the U.S. that gives us some cross uh, pollination there. Um, <laughs> how, how do you feel about the fact that your books really can't be categorized? You know, we're trying to be like uh -huh, historical fiction, mystery, romance, you know, like what? You know, do you like that? Do you like the fact that they're they can't be pigeonholed? Yeah, I mean, like I kind of like it. I mean, I read. I mean, I read a lot of cross genre books anyway. Like, I don't. I think, yes, sometimes it's useful if you're like I'm in the mood for historical fiction. Then yes, I guess it is useful to be able to go, okay, what's in that section? But, but quite often I'm not picking books that way. Mm -hmm. Um, I I mean. I buy books or I get random books out of the library and they sit on a pile for weeks anyway. So it's, it's rarely what I'm into at the time. Um, but I always think most of my favorite books, they might be classed as one genre, but they're often doing different stuff. So for example, one of my favorite ever books is Fingersmith by Sarah Waters, which is historical fiction, but it could also be categorized as crime. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it's essentially about, you know, fingersmith is the old word for a pickpocket. And, it, and it's, about, it's about ripping off um, this family, essentially. And then there's like a massive, like, it's very, it's just brilliant. Everyone should read it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like lots of those novels, you know, so many of the classics have a crime in. Mm -hmm. We just don't call them crime novels. So, yeah, I think... Um, yeah, I think I'm always going to be like sort of playing with genre and not being pigeonholed. But also it's fun because I get invited to the crime writing festivals and I get invited to the historical fiction festivals. Mm -hmm. So I can hang out with lots of different people. <laughs> <laughs> I know you said that you were just at what, a crime one up in Scotland last week? That was last weekend. Um, yeah, the festival called Bloody Scotland. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like three days of panels and... Um, lots of crime writers although I was on a panel with two historical crime writers so mm -hmm. uh, lots of cross genre -ing. um and in a couple of weeks I'm doing a historical fiction evening with lots of historical fiction authors and yeah it should be good <laughs> I think it's interesting that I think that the genre thing is more of a publishing thing like they need to they need to have a genre but actually you're just writing the story that that you're writing Exactly, exactly. I think, yeah, they, I mean, they put it into whichever category they think will help sales, <laughs> I assume. Um, but yeah, I think there's lots of us, especially in terms of historical mystery, I feel like there are lo lots of us out there writing that. I mean, like, it's almost a genre on its own anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm sort of just discovering it and I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. Because I feel like the same way about romance. Like almost every book has some element of romance in it, but it's not a romance book. So um, I don't know if you call that cross genre. It's just that life has romance in it. Life has, you know, relationships, messy relationships. And that's what I, I enjoy reading. 
So um, it's, I'm glad that you're writing what you're writing because it opens up our eyes and our minds. Um, so we're just about out of time. I just want to make sure there's no other questions. Susan's like, I'm going to go out and buy those, you know, read your books. <laughs> Can't wait. Um, that's wonderful. Um, Louise, thank you so much for being with us today and um, for all of this amazing conversation around your books and your history and a lot of things that I think we all need to be thinking about. So I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. This has been really fun. <laughs> Good. I Well, Good luck. And I hope that you hit the U.S. at some point and you, I can actually meet you in person. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a wonderful night. Thank you all for coming today. And I hope that you find Louise's books either at the bookstore or at the library. Bye, everyone.